that's an important truth that we always need to remind ourselves of. Um, we're all equally condemned before God. I, there was, uh, to add on just a little bit of what Rick just said there, Carl said it many, many Bible studies ago, and I really liked it, but the Perrine Bridge and the canyon there, imagine different works, different actions that we do. We're all trying to make a different leap to get to the other side of the canyon. Some of us might leap a little bit further than the other, but guess what? We all die equally at the bottom of the canyon every single time. Um, so how much further is the chasm between God and man than that of the Twin Falls Bridge to the bottom of the river there? How much deeper is that chasm? How much further is that righteous life and standard of God than us falling short of that glory? Uh, let's go ahead and turn to Galatians chapter 3, verses 5 through 6 for this morning. That's where we're going to be at today. Um, I started this week preparing for verses seven or 5 through 9, and I realized that it was just far too much to bite off for one Sunday. So we're going to be in verses 5 and 6. Galatians chapter 3, verses 5 through 6. As you're turning there, we'll go ahead and open with a prayer. Lord God, I, I thank you so much, Lord, for your word, Lord, this, this inspired and errant, sufficient, righteous rule before us, Lord. God, I would ask that today you would encourage us to glean this information, to let it reign true in our lives, Lord, because whether or not we like it, it is true. And so God, help us love it, let us cling to it, let us herald the good news that is found within it, Lord. God, I ask this in your mighty name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. So, if you can recall from last week, we are officially in chapter 3 of the book of Galatians. And this, this chapter particularly, in my opinion, gives us a very deep theological teachings and doctrines that will continue to demonstrate uh, just the, the, the singularity of the gospel and then there's some unique perspectives that we need to understand about the law of Moses that we'll see here in this chapter. But like I said, this week's message, I was studying for verses 5 through 9. I found a proposition, found a, a, a theme that we're going to be discussing for these verses, but then realized that it was too much. So today is part one of most likely two parts that we'll go through next Sunday, Lord willing, if we can get through verse 9 then. But this is what we're going to be discussing. We're going to discuss our one God has given us one means of salvation through one man's righteous life, which is Christ, that is received through faith alone for all people without distinction. That means of salvation, that means of the singular gospel is what Paul is defending in this apostolic letter to the churches of Galatia. And this section of Scripture, like all other sections of Scripture that we're looking at, is God's inspired, inerrant, infallible, and sufficient word that is before us. Paul knows that there are wolves that are attacking these churches of Galatia who seek to devour the sheep of God by taking away their joy, satisfaction, and peace that is accompanied with being God's people. These wolves, these Judaizers do this by undermining the authority of Christ and his message as revealed to the prophets and the apostles of old. And you might think to yourself that this letter of Paul to the churches of Galatia are a more a, a letter for more archaic times. We don't have people today that do this. You might think to yourself who are seeking to take away your joy, your satisfaction of knowing God. If you have come here to church today thinking that this is not the case, you are ignorantly wrong. I want to mention this because this week I have been in dialogue with a return missionary from the LDS religion who denies sola scriptura and tota scriptura, which means scripture alone and all of scripture. He denies this because he doesn't believe that the Bible is inerrant and therefore rejects it being infallible, and rejects it being the sufficient rule for our righteousness, our faith. And therefore, he likes to look at external existing uh, uh, prophets, such as the LDS prophets. He, and because of this, he, he argues for a multiplicity of gospels. There's not one, just one gospel. There's a multiple gospels, is what he says. He thinks that there's a plurality of gods, 
He thinks that he himself is an eternal being like you and I. He's gleaned information from modern textual criticism that denies the historicity of the books of the Bible. And therefore, like I said, he has saw the need to subjectively, not objectively, subjectively with his own opinion in mind, follow the words of man that undermine the word of God. You might think, well, how's that the same as what the Judaizers are doing? Well, how's that important for us right here in this text? Why have you even just read the Bible just for us, Braden? Because if we don't start with understanding that this is thus saith the Lord, it doesn't matter what it says. It doesn't matter if you do not understand that this is the inspired word of God that is sufficient for you and I. It doesn't mean anything. This, this man would even say, this LDS, pro, this LDS missionary, not prophet, this LDS missionary sent to me in a message, he said this, if we're going off the Bible alone, which is what I'm arguing for, we have to rely on the interpretations provided by the New Testament authors to arrive at your conclusion that you are, referring to me. And I say, amen, <laughs> you're absolutely right. But he goes on to say this, we don't get that idea that Jesus fulfills these prophecies from the Old Testament alone. You need modern messengers of God to demonstrate that. And he's referring to the Book of Mormon and his prophets. No. The Old Testament is sufficient in revealing Jesus Christ. Every page of your Bible, every paragraph, every doctrine therein is pointing our eyes to Christ Jesus and the fulfillment of what he did in his incarnation, his life, death, burial, and resurrection. And so what we're going to examine today is how Paul demonstrates that exact same conclusion that Abraham had faith in God, in the gospel, the same God in the same gospel that he himself has faith in. Augustine, an early church father, stated this, the New Testament is the old concealed, and the Old Testament is the new revealed. Compare Augustine's words to that of Paul to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 15-17, which says, And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are, listen, the sacred writings, what do you think Paul is referring to when he says that to Timothy? The Old Testament. And he says, Which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And you might say, Braden, where is Christ Jesus in the Old Testament? He is everywhere. They were sufficient at revealing that truth for us. Paul then says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. The man of God, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Brothers and sisters, this understanding, this reminder that the word of God is inspired, that when we look at Galatians 3 and we understand what the Judaizers were doing, they were trying to undermine the words of the apostle by saying, no, it's not just faith in Christ alone that you need. Here's a knife. Go circumcise yourself. What have they done in the process? They have undermined the inspiration and the authority, the inerrancy of the words of the apostles in the Old Testament in the process. The good news of Christ has always been present within Scripture, both in the Old and the New. Both portions of Scriptures are true and inspired. And the Old Testament was like a pregnant woman with Christ as her unborn child. Jesus is found in every page of the Old Testament, whether through shadow, type, or prophecy. And the New Testament, however, is the testimony and the record of the birth of that child, Christ, that was found within the Old. I wanted to give you time before we... I wanted to give this time to, to mention these things before we read Galatians 3. Because again, I want us to confidently look at these verses and say, this is what the Lord has spoken to us. It is sufficient, it is inerrant, and we can rest our heads on this truth that we're going to read here. Let's go ahead and read verses 5 through 9 so we understand where we're going to go next week, next Sunday. It says this, So then does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham 
believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. That's the text. These are the two verses that we're looking at today, but verse 7 and on. So now know that those who are of faith, those are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, proclaim the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the nations will be blessed in you. So then those who are of the faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. What did Paul in the very first chapter argue for? There's only one gospel and to reject anyone who says there's a second or a third or a fourth or a fifth or so on. And what did Paul just say here? Abraham believed the same gospel. It's throughout the entirety of God's word and I hope that that is what we will see today. So before we look at verses 5 to to 6 today, let's go ahead and pray before we talk anymore. Lord God, I thank you for the singularity of this gospel, the gospel that saves both Abraham, Isaac, and even a sinner like myself, Lord, and everybody else here who places faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, this is the good news and there is none other. Lord, we thank you for what is revealed here to us and we take confidence that this is inerrant, that this is true, that this is objective, that it does not matter how any of us in this room feel about this text, but that it remains true regardless of our feelings. And Lord, help us conform our minds to what Scripture says here, that we might glorify you and know you better today. And we ask this in your name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. So as far as context goes, especially for us that that are jumping right in here in chapter 3, this letter is written by Paul to the churches of Galatia to correct them who are foolishly following after Judaizers who sought to undermine the apostolic authority of the Apostle Paul by undermining the teachings, uh, by saying that there was another means of righteousness other than faith alone in Christ alone. That's the whole goal of the Judaizers, whether they knew it, whether they liked it or not, that's what their goal was. And last week we covered how if we believe that righteousness comes through law keeping or anything other than Christ, that we are then therefore saying that Christ died needlessly, And not only that, if that's what we place our faith in today, our actions, our works, our filthy rags, so on and so forth, you are a fool. Paul says, O foolish Galatians, who bewitched you? Who tricked you? Who duped you out of believing in the true gospel that was already proclaimed to you by myself and the other apostles? So now with that in the back of our mind, that's the context. Let's go ahead and look here at verse 5. It says this. So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you, do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Now I want you to notice in here in verse 5, who is it that provides the believer, the Christian, with the Spirit? And by what means does he provide that spirit to us with? It says he, speaking of God, he is the one that provides this with us. And here we see the working of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is residing and provided for us, to us. I think we see this kind of language all throughout Scripture with regard to both the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But Paul not only talks about the indwelling or the uh, giving of the Spirit to you and I, but he also talks about miraculous works here. So not only has God given you the Spirit, but He's also worked miracles in the midst of your churches. Paul is telling the churches, think back about those miracles that you had seen. Whatever those those sign gifts, whatever those miracles were that you can think of that the churches of Galatia would have seen. He's saying, think back at that day. And let's just use the example for the gift of tongues for this, for this portion. This gift, this miraculous gift that Paul is referencing here that happened in the churches of Galatia, who was the one that was working them amongst them? Was it the individuals? No, it says... He who provided the Spirit to you and also worked miracles amongst you. Meaning, God the Spirit was the one that was at work in those days. 
Compare that line of reasoning to that which is often found in the charismatic movement of today. And what I mean by that is the ones that are so hyper in trying to have these signs presented amongst themselves. Uh, I referenced this last week, and again, I, I, I think it's a strange way if I don't give a little bit of context. I was in a hot tub with some strange ladies. But the context is, is I was sitting there with my family, and they got in the hot tub, and then we started talking about Christ, as, as you obviously would know that I would, right? And there in, in this hot tub, this lady starts to say that she has the power to bind the Spirit, that she has the power to, to heal people and all these kind of things. Why is it that the charismatic movement, these people that have fallen victim to this, want to think that they have the authority, that they are the ones performing it? When Paul himself in this text is saying, no, God provided you the Spirit, and God was the one that did the miracles. Who is Paul trying to attribute the glory and the, the honor of these actions to? He's saying, oh, churches, you're so good. Here, you did these things. No, he's saying God is the one who did it. God is the one who gets the praise. God is the one who gets the glory and the honor and the worship for it. Not you. Listen to what Benny Hinn, a, a charismatic maniac and somebody who I would just tell you is a heretic, says. He says this. I'm not part of the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. I'm one of the offices. That's why there's such an anointing on my ministry. I'm anointed to bring healing to the sick. Just the pride that exudes off these type of individuals. And Paul himself, an apostle of the Lord, is he ever talking like that? No. He gives honor and glory to the only being that is worthy of honor and glory. Our triune God is who he attributes these things to. That's just something I want you to take note of in there. But just notice that, that Paul is referencing the churches. Listen, you did not receive the Spirit through the, the, the sharpness of a knife that circumcised yourself. You did not receive the Spirit through your obedience. No, He is the one who gave this to you. And how did this come about? Was it through the law? Paul says here in verse 5, do, did, did you receive this by the works of the law or with hearing with faith? This, this reasoning that we see throughout these, these charismatic movements, the name it and claim it things that we hear about, is just complete idiocy. It's prideful. It's trying to say that I'm the one that can do these things and, and I, can, I can make, I can make, I can become more powerful and make God do my will instead of us do God's will. It is not you who do these miracles. It is God himself who has performed them is what Paul is reminding these people. But Paul again reasons, did you receive the spirit or witness miracles because of the law or through faith? And obviously, brothers and sisters, it was through faith that they had done this. Now, when we talk about faith, there is an example, an analogy that I, I think uh, analogies only can go so far. So don't think that we should put all our weight and, and trust or our, our understanding into analogies. But how many of us grew up with, with siblings and did trust falls with each other? I'm sure Jonathan, I can look back at Jonathan and say, I guarantee you, you and Tom were probably doing trust falls maybe even this week. And I guarantee you one of you didn't catch each other and you fell and you hit yourself, right? But we, we've undoubtedly all had trust falls, right? Is a trust fall a trust fall if, let's say, somebody's standing behind me and I, I buckle my knees as I'm falling? Did I really trust the person? I, I didn't trust the person. What if I grab onto the wall and I assist myself down into their arms? Is that trusting? No. I'm saying I don't have faith that this person can catch me. What does that teach us about trust? Well, first of all, when we do a trust fall and we truly let the person catch us, we're saying that this person is strong enough to catch us, that it's not my will that's catching me. It's completely dependent on this other being. And what do we see with, with faith in Christ, faith in God? It's saying, God, it's not through my works. I'm not going to buckle my knees. I'm not going to hold on to the wall. 
I'm going to let you, I'm going to, I'm going to drop, I'm going to trust, I'm going to fall on the mercy seat of God for this, on the gospel itself, because I know that he is strong enough to catch. I know that he saves and I know salvation is of him and him alone. This type of trust in the gospel, which it, it, it completely out over it, this, that analogy again only goes so far. Trusting in the gospel is so much greater and grander than trusting somebody when you fall, right? They're in a trust fall. But we take assurance that, that Christ has accomplished something on our behalf on the cross. But listen to this. Is this message of trusting God, having faith in God, different for one group of people over another? Or different in one time over another? It's not. It's not. And let's look and see why I say it's not. Verse 6. This is where we're going to be spending the majority of today in. Verse 6. So after, after saying, God provided you with the Spirit, God works miracles amongst yourself, and this is done through faith, not works, Paul then says, just as, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now pause here and remind yourself, is the churches of Galatia made up mostly of Gentiles or Jews? It's mostly Gentiles here. And so Paul is saying, look, just as the faith that you as a Gentile believer has, it is just as Abraham. How this flies in the face of lots of teachings of today. Gentiles are saved by the same means that Abraham was? Absolutely he was. Had the churches of Galatia come to have faith through a different means than that of Abraham? Or has Christianity, have, have you and I come to have faith in a different gospel or a different God than that of Abraham? And the answer is no, absolutely not. Let's go and read this account in Genesis 15 verses 1 through 6. And I really want you to put your, put your study glasses on and let's look and see what this has to say for us. Genesis 15 verses 1 through 6. That's where we're at. Genesis 15, 1 through 6. Genesis 15, verse 1 through 6 says this. After these things, the word of Yahweh came to Abraham or Abram in a vision saying, Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be great. And Abram said, O Lord God or O Lord Yahweh, what will you give me as I go on being childish, childless, not childish, childless, and the heir of my house is Elzar, of Damascus. And Abram said, Since you have given no seed to me, behold, the one in my house is my heir. Verse 4. Then behold, the word of Yahweh came to him. The word of the Lord came to him, saying, This will not be your heir but one who will come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Now look toward the heavens and number the stars, if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your seed be. Then he believed in Yahweh, and he counted to him as righteousness. Stay in Genesis 15. John 8, 56 to 59 says this. Your father Abraham rejoiced. This is Jesus speaking to the Pharisees. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. 
So the Jews said to him, you are not 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him. Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Stay in Genesis. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Stay in Genesis 15, John 1, 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of truth and grace. Stay in Genesis 15 and look at verse 4 with me. Then behold, the word of Yahweh. Then behold, the word of Yahweh. There's a reason why the author of, of the Gospel of John, John himself says, in the beginning was the word. Who was Abraham looking at right there? The Word. The Word of the Lord. Abraham saw the Word of Yahweh. That, that Word is God who became flesh and credited His righteous life to all those who believe while also imputing their sin into Himself while He died as their propitiation upon a cross. We do not place our faith in a different word than that of Abraham. Abraham saw the word Christ, and Christ promised that he would be his heir. Did you catch that in there? That one that you think is your heir, Abraham? It's not. Come with me and look outside and see the stars. Abraham looks and he sees the stars and then he looks back at Christ, looks back at the word and what does it say? He was credited with righteousness. Abraham had a supernatural faith that looked to what? The word. He trusted in Jesus Christ this is the absurdity of all false religions that say, well, you can't find Jesus in the word of the Old Testament. No, you can. Think back to Exodus chapter 3 when we see that first name of, of God given to man, I am that I am. And here you have Jesus in John 8 telling the Pharisees right before they try to stone him for blasphemy, he says, I am. You will die in your sins if you do not believe I am. What does it happen to say in Exodus 3? It says the angel of the Lord, the messenger of the Lord. Another way to say, and the word of the Lord appeared in the burning bush and said, I am that I am and you shall go to the people of Egypt, the people, the children of Israel and say, I am has sent me. Abraham saw Christ and he was glad. Where do you think Abraham was glad? He was glad when he was credited righteousness. Brothers and sisters, you and I look at that same word today. In the end of the, the Gospel of John in chapter 20, after doubting Thomas comes and he presses his fingers in the nail prints that have been suffered for you and I. John says, so these things have been written to you so that you might not be unbelieving, but believing. Brothers and sisters, every time we open up God's Word, the 66 books of the Bible, guess what we're looking at? We're looking at the way that God has revealed Himself to you and I. The Word. Christ Jesus Himself. Place faith in that today. Abraham saw the Word. He saw, he saw Christ Christ promised, the word promised right then there in Genesis 15. I hope you're still there. He promised that he would be his heir, that he would bless the nations, that he would be the seed who would bless all who are in him, and that he would credit righteousness not only just to Abraham, but to also those who are far off, you 
and I. Abraham believed God, beloved church. He believed in the same gospel as you and I. The same Christ and the same God as you and I place our faith in today. He was given salvation by the same means as you and I. He was saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. According to Scripture alone. And guess whose glory that this is all to alone? God Himself. Abraham, like you and I, is a part of the same body, Christ Jesus. He's a part of the same people. Look around, it's the church. He was saved on credit, and now we are saved on debit. As Abraham looked forward, we look back. But guess what? The payment is all the same. Jesus Christ taking our wage of sin on Himself, all while giving us undeserving righteousness. The word of the Lord came and spoke to Abraham. Do you place your faith today in the same word that Abraham had faith in? If you don't, today is the day to have faith in him. He is sure he will not let you fall. He is strong enough to catch you. And he is worthy enough to trust. Now you might think to yourself, turn back to Galatians 3 now. Turn back to Galatians 3. Galatians 3.6. Galatians 3, six. Just as Abraham, so just as, the same, just as Abraham, O Gentile church, just as this, this, as the Judaizers are coming into the church and saying, you see, we're of the true faith, we're the Jews, you need to be circumcised in order to be saved. Paul says, just as their same father Abraham, that they're trying to suppose authority over you as, just as Abraham believed God and was credited with righteousness. You might say, well, what about the opposition that every cult and false religion tries to take us to? Which guess where they're going to quote from? And it's a favorite text of mine. They're going to take you to James chapter 2, which says, faith without works is dead. I want to address this right now today. So turn with me to James chapter 2. And let's compare what Galatians is teaching to what James is teaching. Because guess what my argument is? They're teaching the exact same message. There's no distinguishing contradictive word here. James chapter 2, verse 14 through 26 is what we're going to read right here. And the reason we want to read verses 14 through 26 is because these cults and false religions, guess what, what they do? They only read a singular verse in here instead of reading the whole thing in context. They read verse 17, which says, Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead by itself. And let's look at what the context has to say. Because if that means justification before God, this book stands in opposition to 65 other inspired books that we have in our Bible. So it... Either it's contradictive or there's something else there to it, right? Verse 14 through 26 says this. What use is it, my brothers? If someone says he has faith, but he has no works, can that faith save him? I want to read that again. Can that faith save him? If a brother or a sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead by itself. But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But you, are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, 
and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. That's exactly what we just read from, from Galatians chapter 3 and Genesis chapter 15. And he was called a, the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Well, there you have it. Apparently, Galatians is all wrong if this text is to be taken as the understanding that many do by saying that you save yourself, you maintain your salvation through works. You receive righteousness from God through actions. And this should make us all be creeping and crawling within our skins because this is in opposition to the one singular gospel that Abraham and you and I are saved in. So when we look at this, what are some, some quick notes that we can take about why we know that that cannot be the case? Firstly, if a man is justified by works, what works are listed here? What works does James argue? If that is the interpretation we are to take, it's faith plus works. What works does James tell us to do here that will justify us? Well, let's just look at one example. Offering up Isaac. So if faith, if it, this is what I would tell this, these individuals that want to go to this chapter and say, you see, faith plus works save you. I'll say, okay, let me go grab a knife and get my son and put him up on the altar and sacrifice him right here and right now. Because that's the work that is mentioned. Is that, what, is that what's going to save me? And every false religion, guess what they would say? Oh, no, 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 don't do that. We meant you come to our church and give us tithing. We meant you come and you do all these other things. No, James 2 tells me, kill my firstborn. Is that what I'm going to do? So right there, they're not arguing for James chapter 2, brothers and sisters. What's the second thing that we can say? There are several references here to different passages. And one is from Genesis 15, which we already read. But guess where another quote is from in here? Genesis chapter 22, with the offering up of Isaac. Now, I'm not a mathematician, but what comes first, 15 or 22? I'm a fireman, I'm not very smart, but I'm pretty sure it's 15 comes first. Genesis 15 is where Abraham is credited with righteousness. What came first, being, first, being credited with righteousness or sacrificing Isaac? Crediting righteousness. Several years have gone by while Abraham has been credited with righteousness without works. Okay? So right there, this should tell us that there's something else that's being talked about in here that James is referencing. And thirdly, this is where the context plays the most importance for us. What question is James answering in James chapter 2, verse 14? What use is it, my brothers, so he's talking to Christians, if someone... So imagine in here, if someone came through this door, we have a homeless person sitting in the back with no clothes and is hungry, and that person came in and said... I'm praying for you. I'm going to go get in my car and go get clothes and go get food and I'm, I'm praying for you. We'd all look at him and say, what are you doing? Why not help this person? Wait a second. This is horizontal justification. Can that faith save him? Question mark. Is that a true faith is what is being asked in there. If someone comes in and is kicking a homeless person as they come through the front door... Are they actually saved and are they demonstrating fruits that are accompanied with salvation? No, they're not. So when Abraham was saved in at Genesis 15, which we know he was saved because guess what? God's inspired, infallible, and errant word tells us such. In 15 years before Genesis chapter 22, could you and I have looked at Abraham and seen the faith that he had? Can any of us look in this room and say, oh yeah, you have faith, you have faith. No, faith is an internal thing. Can any of us look at Abraham in Genesis 15 when, when the word of Yahweh walks Abraham outside and tells him to look up, could we see him place faith in God that day? No. That's a profession that takes place. 
Where might you and I look to say Abraham truly had faith? He was obedient to God after that. Genesis 22, does that not demonstrate that he had faith in Genesis 15 by being obedient to God in Genesis chapter 22? Absolutely. So Genesis 3 and James 2 is not contradicting each other. Genesis or uh, Galatians 3 is talking about vertical justification between God and man, while James 2 is saying, what use is it, brothers, talking horizontally? The way that we are to judge one another to see if there's actual faith there in God and one another. We look at works for those examples. To, exi- to see exactly this, and we're going to finish out here. So again, Galatians 3, verse 5 and 6. Who provided you with the Spirit? It was God. Who works miracles among us? It is God. Just as Abraham believed. So it's the unity of the faith in here. So just like Abraham believed in Christ, you and I believe in Christ. Let's now compare that with Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. Romans 4, verses 1 through 12. I love context, brothers and sisters, because all these false religions, guess what they don't do? They don't read the context. Romans 4, 1 through 12 is talking about, guess what kind of justification? Vertical justification. How was a man made right to stand before God? How was Abraham made right to stand before God? Was it through circumcision or through faith? That's what Paul is arguing here for. Verses 1 through 12, it says this. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. So is this before brothers or is this before God? This is vertical justification. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wage is not counted according to grace, but according to what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes upon him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness to the person who doesn't buckle their knees and to the person who does not lower themselves slowly into the arms of God, the person that trusts he will catch us, trust that he will save us, trust that he has done it, he will not die in wrath. Let's keep on reading what it says in here. Just as David, so not only Abraham, but verse 6, just as David also speaks of the blessings on the man to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose, uh, whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Therefore, if this blessing on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also, for we say faith counted, faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Again, I love what Paul's doing in here because guess what argument he's making? There wasn't chapter breaks yet, right? In this day. Chapter breaks is a modern invention. Verse breaks are a modern invention. Paul is saying, what came first? Faith or circumcision? What came first, brothers and sisters? 15 or 17, because that's the two chapters in Genesis that I was talking about here. Chapter 15 comes first. Faith comes first. How was it counted to him? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, circumcision, a seal of righteousness and of the faith which he had while uncircumcised so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be counted to them. And the father of circumcision to those who do, who not only are the circumcision, but also who follow in the steps of faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. Now, this is the conclusion that I want to put forth for us, brothers and sisters. Uh, we're going to read 13 to 17 for this. So keep your eyes there in Romans 4. 13 to 17 says this. For the promise to Abraham or to his seed, 
that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith has been made empty and the promise has been abolished. For the law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, there is no trespass. For this reason, it is by faith, in order that it may be accounted to grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also those who are of the faith of Abraham. Sorry, excuse me. Not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, a father of many nations have I made you in the presence of him who he believed, even God who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. We are the dead who have been called into existence through faith alone. For this is the promise that was given to Abraham, that Christ, as the heir of Abraham, would be his seed that would bring salvation not only to Abraham himself, but to you and I who are far off. Rest today in his grace and follow the way, the truth, and life, Jesus the word of the Lord, the same word that Abraham saw and was glad, the same word that credited him with his own righteousness, Jesus the Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you so much, Lord, for this text. I thank you for the continuity and the inerrancy and the inspired nature of this, this Bible that we look at today, Lord. We thank you with the clarity that and the precision that you have given the apostles to write these words down to us, to those churches in the first century, to those churches that are saved in the same exact way that we are. So Lord, please today strengthen our faith in you. Let us have confidence that we are in the same being Christ that Abraham was, that we've been covered by the same exact righteousness that we would be standing next to Abraham knowing that we're equally dead in our sins, but that we've been equally made righteous through Jesus Christ. And I ask this in the mighty name, Jesus Christ, who saves us.